Okay, hello everyone. We're gonna get started now. Thank you so much to everybody for joining us today. We had a great response on this webinar and we're so excited that everybody could be here. In case you don't know Venable, I'll just say a few minutes at the beginning, we are a full service privacy and data security practice. We have over 20 attorneys focused just on this area. Only three of us on the call today, but there are more of us in the wings. Um, we cover compliance, investigations, contracting, product counseling, M&A, and basically everything that clients can come up with. We also work very closely with a non-attorney team of cybersecurity consultants um, who bring a more technical expertise to the table. So that's um, what we do and we really enjoy it. And we're happy to share it with you today. I'm Julia Tama. I'm one of the partners in our group. I focus mainly on US compliance and US investigations, particularly in front of the Federal Trade Commission. I've been at Venable for almost 14 years now, and I have to say there has never been a dull moment, partly because the laws keep changing and the technology keeps changing. And that's a lot of what we'll be talking about today. I'll turn it over to Kelly to introduce herself and then my partner, Eric, as well. Hi, Julia, thank, and thank you so much to everyone who's joining. I am also a partner in Venable's Privacy Group based in Washington, D.C. with Julia. My practice focuses equally on compliance with federal and state privacy laws, everything from A to Z, some of which we're going to discuss today. Uh, I also help U.S. companies think through their EU data protection obligations. The other half of my time is spent defending clients and adversarial proceedings in front of the Federal Trade Commission, a uh, practice that I share with with Julia, um, in front of the state attorneys general and other regulatory agencies that enforce privacy and data security obligations. Eric, over to you. Thanks, Kelly. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, I'm Eric Jones. I'm a partner in the privacy group as well. I spend my time uh, sort of between the Chicago and the DC offices. And like both Julia and Kelly, I also uh, advise uh, our clients on compliance with state privacy laws and federal laws as well. And I um, represent clients in front of uh, state AGs, in front of the FTC, in front of congressional committees. And part of that's based upon my experience in government. I spent a number of years working in both the Illinois Attorney General's office um, and in the, this, on the Senate Commerce Committee and the House Oversight Committee. It's nice to be here. Thanks. So taking a look at our agenda slide for today, there's a number of things that we want to cover, certainly no shortage of federal state developments in privacy. So we'll talk a little bit about what has been going on on the state front first, looking at some differences and then just how companies can deal with the differences between these laws. Um, and then we'll look a little bit at enforcement. So hopefully if the compliance works, you don't have to end up in the enforcement conversation, but we tend to believe that it's good for everybody to know what could be coming and be prepared for it in case it does. So we'll talk about state enforcement and then we'll talk a bit about the Federal Trade Commission and what they've been doing. And then Kelly will wrap us up with some very timely updates in terms of what has been happening on the international data transfer front. Not our focus today to talk about international, but we just thought it was so pertinent that we wanted to make sure we said a few words about it. So I'll to start, I'll turn it over to Eric, who will begin with a recap of what's been going on in the States. Thanks, Julia. Uh, I'm going to spend just a couple minutes covering the state of play at the state level on privacy, just to make sure we're all up to speed before we get into the compliance discussion and the enforcement discussion. Um, thank you for advancing the slide already. Um, so as you can see from our first slide, we now have five states that have passed laws with, with what we call comprehensive privacy regimes. Those states are California, Utah, Colorado, Virginia, and Connecticut. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a visual that captures the timeline for the laws that have been enacted at this point. You'll see that we started with California, in 2018 um, via a ballot initiative, followed by another ballot initiative in California, the CPRA, that amended the CCPA in, in 2020. There's going to be a lot of Cs out of California today. And then uh, since 2020, we have been averaging two states per year. So first off, we had uh, Virginia and Colorado in 2021, and then we had Utah and Connecticut both in 2022. Now, this presentation is focused on compliance, so we're not going to spend much time playing the prognostication game for which states will come next um, in the legislative cycles next year. But it is important to note, I think, just, just one point for, from a con for a compliance perspective, and that's that we will surely see additional states in 2023 and beyond. Uh, we're not going to get into sort of the guessing game on where those states will be, but you can rest assured that we'll continue to see um, uh, state developments. Let's go to the next slide. 
So here's perhaps for, for my brief overview, just on the state of play, here's the most important slide for our purposes, which is when are these laws actually uh, be became effective or will become effective? So as I'm sure you all know, the CCPA has been in effect since January 2020. And the changes to the CCPA via the CPRA will become effective uh, just in a couple months in January of 2023, which is also when Virginia will come online. Um, 2023 is going to be a busy year um, for privacy compliance because by the end of it, um, we will have Colorado, Connecticut, and Utah will also all become effective. And um, next slide. Thank you. I'll now turn it over to Julia, who's going to walk us through First, the key distinctions between the states, and most importantly, how to tackle state law compliance. Julia? Thank you. So we wanted to show you a chart um, which shows some visually that the differences and similarities among these five new state laws that are coming into effect. So CPRA is the new California one, and then you can see each of the states by their abbreviation coming into the next columns. And I kind of feel like there are two ways to look at this chart. So glass half full, glass half empty, right? We can look at this chart and we can see that there are many differences. Certainly, you know, there are columns that don't look like the ones next to them. There are a lot of gaps, et cetera. It, there, there are differences. And once you start to drill down into the language of these laws, there are even more differences. None of them have the same language, even if they might have the same themes. But on the glass half full side, there are also a lot of commonalities. And so that's where we're really working to help clients these days get up to speed ahead of these 2023 deadlines that Eric just highlighted for us. So we're working to develop the most uniform approach possible. That's what we're hearing from companies that they typically want. It's easier to administer. It makes sense for consumers and it's helpful. So we're not trying to get anybody to over comply, but we're looking at those spaces where the laws are similar and you can leverage existing processes um, as much as possible or the same processes across multiple states. And part of that is because of what Eric mentioned about the possibility of future state laws coming online. So we don't want to put clients in a position of building things that will only be good for today's laws. Hopefully we can look for those common themes which are likely to pop up in any future laws and help companies be ready to compare to, to prepare for those. So I want to, again, emphasize that there are a lot of commonalities across these charts. That's kind of where we'll be spending a lot of time talking today and is where we're helping clients a lot today to get ready. There's just one other thing that I want to highlight on this chart, and that is the next to last row that talks about this um, pseudonymous data. So the issue is, do consumer rights apply to pseudonymous data, meaning information really that identifies a device, but not necessarily a natural person? You can kind of boil it down that way. I, I, this is something that frequently gets overlooked and depending on your company may be really important. So in the new state laws that are that are not California, right, the other four states, most of the consumer rights don't actually apply to pseudonymous data, only the right to opt out. So depending on where your company sits in the market, that may be something that's really critical for you in easing that burden of compliance. We're not going to spend a ton of time on it today because it's not really relevant to all companies, but it may be for yours. And if so, we really want to spend a moment just highlighting that. So now we'll move on and talk a little bit more about just the practicalities of compliance. Um, so we can go on to the next slide. Thank you. So this is just an overview of the things that we're doing today or the kinds of things that we're doing today to help clients get ready for the new state laws. And this is kind of, you know, it's high level. This is probably, these are probably things that are necessary for most, if not all companies out there. So mapping and data mapping and legal gap assessment, we'll talk about more, not technically required, but kind of a really great place to start. Then we're kind of sequencing clients to look at their policies and notices, their contracts. Those are things that will be visible from outside the company that are important to kind of get in line so you don't get unnecessary questions from outside about what your compliance posture is. And then companies might be looking to the sensitive data if that impacts them, consumer rights requests and the like. The last bullet here where we'll spend just a little bit amount of time because again it doesn't 
affect everybody, but California is expanding their law to cover all personnel and business to business data. So for those of you who are already familiar with the world of CCPA and what California law is today, one of the major changes coming with the new law at the beginning of 2023 is that all those same rights and all those same obligations will be applying to data about your personnel, including even applicants and temporary employees and about your business contacts. So your marketing prospects, you know, other companies that you deal with in any diff any capacity, even like your vendor contacts, for example. So that's a huge change. We could really do a whole webinar just on that, and maybe we will, but that's not today's webinar. So we'll, we'll be covering it relatively briefly. So on to the next slide, we'll start by talking a bit about analysis and assessment. So I mentioned that some of the starting places that we suggest to companies are updating or creating a data map or conducting a legal gap analysis. So the data map being, what do you have? Where do you have it? That will tell you where your obligations lie. Again, not required, but we are definitely finding that it's one of the really useful steps for companies to do this so that you know what you're dealing with and then all the other compliance steps can kind of follow from there. It also helps because you'll have a baseline. If laws do update, you'll be able to know where to look. So it kind of saves you from reinventing the wheel. Um, likewise, a legal gap analysis, not specifically required under these laws, but a very useful place to start because you may already have certain compliance steps in place. And frankly, you may have processes in place that you can even leverage for these new laws. So that's a place you can start to figure out what is your checklist of things that you need to do to come into compliance with the newest laws, depending on what you have. One thing that I do wanna highlight under that is that we really encourage clients to look at and take advantage of the available exemptions. Sometimes we get questions that sort of indicate that exemptions were not taken advantage of and that's just a lot of unnecessary work for the company. So, you know, we really encourage at the beginning of the process, there are exemptions that are, you know, for different types of data or different types of entities. And then there are also exemptions that are specific to different obligations, like deletion under California has a number of different exceptions that may mean that deletion doesn't have to be carried out. So it's really important to look at all those exemptions. It can feel kind of overwhelming because of the complexity, but it can really resolve some headaches down the road if you look at those from the start. So any legal gap analysis should take account of those exceptions and make sure that you're taking advantage of them if you do have them. Another thing to decide up front is about geographic scope. So there's a decision point in terms of the U.S. Would you limit obligations or would you limit certain processes just to the five states where they might be required or would you expand them nationwide? wide? The answer is obviously going to depend on a lot of factors, including what your business is and what your relationship is with your customers and consumers. I will say that with a lot of companies, we're seeing a desire to limit the personnel and the business to business obligations to California because that is just one market. Um, so for those who are interested in what others are doing, that is a trend that I would say anecdotally we are seeing. For other things, you know, in terms of the consumer rights, it really very much depends on the company again, whether it's going to be a state by a, a five state model or more of a nationwide application with the application in the other 45 states being voluntary. We'll look at the next slide now, which continues the theme of analysis and assessment. One thing that can be helpful is during the legal gap analysis to start thinking about sequencing the tasks towards compliance. And in particular, to look at those tasks that might require engineering and development. So for example, changing a little button on your home screen to meet California law requirements, that can be something you have to put in the pipeline in advance in order to have it ready on January 1st. So we definitely think that there should be thought in terms of the um, gap analysis and the gap assessment to begin building out that timeline and in particular emphasizing things that are going to require engineering or even just input from different parts of the company, multiple parts of the company. We should highlight also that Colorado's law will require adherence to opt-out signals, sometimes like one version that's frequently talked about is global privacy control. That's not coming in 2023 yet for Colorado, but it's a little ways down the line. And that's definitely something that's going to take development for a lot of companies. So that's something to be aware of while the regula regulations are, are still being worked on. The last bullet here that I just want to highlight is I've started out by saying that the gap analysis and the data mapping are not required, but we do have several states that actually require data protection assessments. So this is something that you would be familiar with if your company operates in Europe and maybe you've been filling out privacy impact assessments 
in past years already. It's new to the United States. It didn't exist under California's previous law. So now we have a new obligation in some of these states to fill out privacy impact assessments in certain cases, like if the company processes personal data for targeted advertising or sells data, for example. So that could be something that's totally new and that would need to be done in terms of your background compliance. The next slide we will talk about policies and contracts. So like I said, the, the overview slide, we presented things in you know, kind of a rough chronological order for how you might wanna sequence things. So in terms of the policies and contracts, the philosophy would be to start with compliance steps that are externally visible and can take some time. So we are really encouraging you know, updates to privacy notices. They, each of these five laws require that the notices have some different specific types of information. None of it is too long, none of it is too difficult, but it's a good time to get ahead of it because that's something you're gonna wanna have ready absolutely by the deadlines in each of those states. And again, in terms of trends, we're seeing a lot of companies just kind of prepare blanket updates that they may be planning to push out on January 1st. You certainly can take a more state-by-state -state approach if you want. There are you know, some ways that you could do that, but we see many opting for more of a January 1st approach if they can manage the timeline. We're also definitely encouraging at this time to get started on contracts because of course that takes a while to work its way through the system and negotiate with all the partners. So the new laws all have contractual requirements for service providers or processors. So you may be one with respect to your customer or you may have service providers, processors in terms of your vendors. And so those requirements have changed. They were pretty light under California law and they're much more extensive now. So we're doing in this area, a lot of what I kind of call strategic contracting. So training, commercial, teams to take over as much of the privacy contracts as possible using templates, using playbooks, using training, um, and just trying to streamline the whole process with new templates and checklists and kind of get ahead of it. Because we do have a list of requirements for the state laws, and we can just follow those to get to the finish line. Next, we'll talk for a moment about um, whatever's on the next slide. Thank you, data restrictions. So two concepts, separate concepts on this slide. One is the sensitive personal data requirements. So the new state laws introduce this new concept. It's not a new concept, but it's new for US law to have a definition of sensitive personal data. Um, and of course, they've all taken different approaches. This is one of the hardest places to take a uniform approach because the laws are pretty different on sensitive data. So this can be a challenge. Some of the states require an opt-in consent upfront for processing sensitive data. California is an opt-out choice. So this is one where you're going to need to evaluate what sensitive data your organization is collecting and figure out how you're gonna tackle those requirements or whether you might just start to minimize your sensitive data use. And here is also where we would suggest to start to inventory the California personnel and business contact data. So I mentioned how, you know, for some companies, this may not be a big deal. Perhaps you don't have a big California market or you don't have personnel in California. For others, this may be a huge change because this type of law has not been applied to this type of data before. In the G under the GDPR, of course, if you're familiar with that, this would already be your reality. But for the US, it's quite new. So for those with California obligations who have not been down the GDPR path before, this will be a significant change and one you wanna start looking at. On the next slide, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, consumer rights requests. So this is gonna be a big one for a lot of companies, if you're or especially if you're already getting a large volume of requests from California. So you would need to be prepared to execute the new consumer rights. A lot of them will look a lot like California. It just may involve some more volume. Also, there is a new right that is involved with the new laws, which is the right to request correction of inaccurate personal data. And that's not something we had under California law in particular. So that's an area where really any company that's US only and hasn't done this for GDPR is gonna need to develop new things. So you'll need to be prepared also potentially to execute at greater scale than you have under California as well with the expansion to the new states. There also are new requirements in relation to opt-outs. So California has always had an opt-out 
from sales. And we know, especially under the Sephora case that came out fairly recently, we know that that can also include disclosures for targeted advertising, or rather making data available for targeted advertising. But the four new states have a slightly broader right to opt out of all processing for targeted advertising. So that could include internal processing for targeted advertising. We haven't seen that before. So if that's kind of processing that your company does, that may impact you and would be something that you would need to be able to implement. Next slide, please. So in terms of where do we stand, are we there yet in terms of knowing even what the state laws require? Not yet, unfortunately. So we're still waiting for regulations. Colorado has put out draft regulations, but they are not expected to be finalized for a number of months. California has now put out two versions of draft regulations. Um, there's a lot of red line even in that second one, and we don't really have a timeline for final ones either. So this is definitely a situation where we are uh, building the plane while flying it um, because the regulators are as well with regulations. So those that can involve some choices about, are you gonna build to regulations or wait to see if they're gonna change? Anybody who's operating in this area is gonna wanna stay absolutely on top of those developments because we are pivoting very quickly with clients as changes are coming out, um, especially given the development time required to make some of these um, changes to practices. So those are, those are some thoughts on state compliance front, and I'll turn it over to Eric next to tell us a little bit more about how enforcement works for these laws and some considerations there. Great. Thanks, Julia. And um, I wanted to make a couple very brief administrative announcements. Um, first off, there have been some great questions that have come in. We will do our best to answer them um, during the, the webinar. If we cannot get to them, we will follow up with you individually um, after the webinar is over at some point soon. Um, secondly, now I should say if, if we get another 100 questions or something, I can't promise that, but at this point it looks, it looks manageable. Um, secondly, there was a question one individual had that probably others might have as well um, about the slides. They will be available um, at some point after the presentation. So this is not the only time you will see them. And then finally, um, I, it is my responsibility to give you your CLE uh, password, which is, and I know that's not why you all are here, but I do need to share it. It is developments 2022. So that's developments 2022. It's not case sensitive, so it doesn't need to be capitalized, but development is plural, developments 2022. So as Julia mentioned, um, now, now back to our regular scheduled program. As Julia mentioned, I'm going to talk about uh, enforcement at the state level. And um, you know, the whole the goal here is, is to, to have compliance so we don't have to, to, to deal with questions from um, AGs or state agencies. Um, but it's also very important to understand where this is all headed and, and, and what they're up to. And, and you know, I should mention, we're, we're, we're not this panel. I mean, this webinar is not about what's happening at the federal level. Um, but I will say, I, I don't think, you know, where we are, it's, it, we're not expecting the, the federal level to come in and, and sort of save us and have anytime soon with preemption and there'll just be one national sort of standard that we have to follow. Um, for the time being, this is where we're at. And so um, that's why we're focused on it. So let, let's get to the next slide. Great, so thank you. So here's ba a basic overview of what state enforcement is gonna look like. Uh, I'll, I'll go through each state individually, but I did wanna, there, there's some sort of broader points to make here. Um, first off, these state laws are largely, and I say largely because there's going to be an exception to that, but they are largely going to be enforced by the state attorneys general. Um, for those of you who may or may not know, state AGs have broad authority at the state level. It's very similar in a lot of cases to the FTC, but it's broader as well in some circumstances. And some of these offices, are they're, they're filled up with assistant AGs who, for a living, enforce the state laws. Um, that's why it's not surprising that the the all the state legislatures that are passing these laws are are first blush giving that enforcement authority to the AAGs because that's what they're used to doing. Um, another sort of broader point I wanted to make is that for the most part, and there's going to be exception related to California again, um, but you know because as Julia mentioned, these these states sort of they're they're sort of you know we're, we're building the airplane as we fly it so to speak. Um, they they are offering a cure period. Um, with along with um, they're offering a cure period along with the um, in, in the state statute, which means when an AG an, finds a violation or a potential violation, they they have to notify the individual or the company 
and then the company has some period of time in order to, to, to fix it. Um, and you'll see that there are a number of these, these cure periods. Now, here's the exception, and that's when we'll get into the specifics. So California is going to be the exception um, for the time being, because California has already been, its law has been in effect since 2020. As I mentioned earlier, it will be, um, there, there are going to be changes made to it coming in um, January because the CPRA becomes effective and the cure period will be ending um, in California. And so that's really an important um, difference between California and the other states at the moment. Uh, the second important distinction is that California through the CPRA has also created a California Privacy Protection Agency, which will also be tasked with enforcement. And it is currently drafting implementing regulations. I'm gonna spend, I need to get through the other states, but I'm gonna spend a little bit more time talking about the California Privacy Protection Agency uh, and its role moving forward because that's going to be very important for enforcement. So um, we can go through these quickly, but just so you sort of get a sense for it, like I said, of Virginia, it's gonna be enforced by the Virginia AG's office. They have, they'll have a 30 day cure period at the outset. Colorado is the same. It's gonna be the Colorado AG as well as district attorneys, which is an important addition. And again, there's a cure period involved. Um, and it also de delegates authority to the Colorado AG to issue regulations, which is something we've already discussed. Uh, let's go to the next slide. And so again, it's sort of, you'll, you're gonna see a bit of a trend here. Um, Connecticut AG enforcement, uh, there's a cure period. Now remember too that, you know, these, these states all have different um, dates when, in, in which they become effective. And then finally, um, Utah as well, uh, sort of similar enforcement and then a uh, 30 day cure period. Um, let's go to the next slide. So let's talk about enforcement in California specifically, because as we've discussed, California is currently the only state that is actively enforcing um, its statute and um, it will continue to be so the only one for, for a little bit. And so they're ahead of the other states. And so it's I think it's important to talk about um, what they've done so far. Uh, one important development is related to a settlement with Sephora that happened just a couple months ago uh, under the CCPA. Um, as part of the settlement, Sephora agreed to a $1.2 million fine. And so that's a, a signal to, to all of us that these fines are real um, and that they are really enforcing it. Um, the attorney general alleged that well, let me back up first. They became aware of the violation, the, potent, the alleged violation by Sephora due to what, would, what was an enforcement sweep of online retailers. And I think these, these sweeps, I think we can expect them to continue um, by California and other states. And what they'll do is they'll send out a lot of letters at one time um, to notify everyone of potential violations that they've seen um, out in the marketplace. And following one of the, a, a sweep of online retailers, the AG's office found that Sephora and its analytics provider had engaged in quote unquote commercial surveillance involving the sale of Californians data to the analytics provider without CCPA prescribed notice or the ability to opt out, including, and this is, this is an important um, uh, point, including via global privacy controls. And I wanted to share just briefly something that the um, AG's office stated in the press release related to the Sephora settlement. Um, the, the press release stated, as part of his ongoing efforts to enforce CCPA, Attorney General Bonta also sent notices today to a number of businesses alleging noncompliance relating to their failure to process consumer opt-out requests made via user-enabled global privacy controls like the GPC. A global privacy control allows consumers to opt out of all online sales in one fell swoop by broadcasting a do not sell signal across every website they visit without having to click on an opt-out link each time. Um, under the CCPA, businesses must treat, and I remember I'm, re I'm reading from the I'm reading from the press release here because I just think it's important to note. Businesses must treat opt-out requests made by user-enabled global privacy controls the same as requests made by users have, who have clicked the do not sell my personal information link. Businesses that receive letters have 30 days to cure the alleged violations or face enforcement from the attorney general. I, I think that's just an important point to note that the fact that they wanted to spend time talking about that in the press release, they're certainly sig sending a signal on where their enforcement's headed uh, to the marketplace. And it also shows, you know, a couple things. One, that the attorney general's office is interpreting the CCP and its obligations on business broadly. 
And secondly, it's focused on adequate disclosures and on consumers' ability to opt out. Um, I don't think we've seen the last of, of these sweeps. Um, and I think when the other states come online, I think we're going to see that is um, we're going to see sweeps there as well. And so I think it's really important to continue to monitor what the state AGs do and what they say, um, because I, I think it's it's going to be important that they show that they're enforcing these laws. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So just a couple points on the CC, the CPPA. Um, as I noted earlier, it created a new the CPRA created a new agency to issue and implement regulations, and that's the CPPA. It's going to be responsible for rulemaking, enforcement, and privacy education. The board is made up of five members. Um, the current members include um, a law school professor, an assistant AG, a senior vice president for LA28, a law firm counsel slash law school professor, and a, an attorney for the Green Lighting Institute. The, C, the CPPA is led by Ashkan Sultani, who it was formerly the chief technologist for um, the Federal Trade Commission. So, you know, they certainly have brought people in who have expertise here. And I think an important note about the CPPA, um, I spent time working in an AG's office, and I think, you know, AG's are certainly across the country when they get the responsibility to enforce these laws, they're going to take the time to enforce. Um, they have to, they're going to, they're going to want to show that they're paying attention when these new laws uh, become, uh, go into effect. Um, but I also think it's important to note that California has, is adding to um, the number of, of individuals who will be enforcing um, their law. And so, um, you know, you'll just have more people every day who are focused on finding violations. And so it, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if unless other states um, commit similar resources that you'll continue to see California be a leader um, on enforcement, even after the other states have, um, you know, their laws have become um, in effect. And I think I saw a question, where was it? Oh, did, did Sephora not have an opportunity to cure? My understanding is that they did, I believe they did have an opportunity to cure. I mean, I think they had to provide that as part of um, as part of the 30 day notice in California um, this year and last year. Um, that 30 day notice requirement is um, 30 day to cure requirement will only go away um, in January. So that would have been that would have been part of the, the matter. And I believe so let's go to the next slide. Okay, that that covers enforcement and I will now turn it over to Kelly who will discuss Kelly and Julia who will be discussing developments at the Federal Trade Commission. So we'll start actually with the next slide um, with a little bit about moving from the state stage over to the federal stage now. And um, we'll try to hop back and address also some of the great questions that have come in to date. But let's um, spend a couple minutes on the Federal Trade Commission first and we'll go back. Um, so the Federal Trade Commission, why, why do we talk about them really in a privacy and data security se session? They enforce... Um, several sector specific data and security and privacy laws. So for example, like you probably have heard of things like Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, Gramm-Leach-Bliley Act, which addresses financial um, privacy. They have some obligations under there. So they have certain sector specific laws that they handle. They also have a broad authority for unfair or deceptive acts or practices in or affecting commerce, which they have used very actively to bring privacy and data security cases. At this point, they have brought hundreds. It's pretty interesting because obviously those words unfair, deceptive, there's nothing in that about privacy and data security, but the US doesn't have a federal sort of overarching privacy and data security law that applies outside of these specific sectors or areas that we've mentioned. And so the Trade Commission has really taken this unfairness and deception authority and used it to uh, become very active in the privacy and data security space. They are, you know, probably everybody on this webinar already knows, they really are the federal enforcer for, for privacy and data security. Others get into the action as well, of course. You know, DOT has some authority. We're seeing Consumer Financial Protection Bureau more and more become active in this space under the current director, especially. So the FTC is not the only game in town, but they're very active. They're a leader and they have historically been a leader in this space. And that's really important to know. 
And it's also important to stay on top of how they are interpreting their unfairness and deception authority. Because if you do get in trouble with the Federal Trade Commission, it can be a very far reaching um, investigation and it can lead to very far reaching remedies. So that's why we like to spend a little time talking about it. We'll be talking about what is the FTC doing currently in terms of um, their work. So moving to the next slide, one thing we did wanna highlight was a, a recent change um, in the FTC's ability to, to bring enforcement cases or, or rather to seek certain kinds of relief in enforcement cases. So historically, since around the 1970s, the um, Federal Trade Commission had looked to a particular authority that it had under Section 13B of the Federal Trade Commission Act to try to get monetary relief in certain types of cases. And that would be based on theories like disgorgement or restitution. The FTC was taking this direction because typically in an unfairness or deception case, it doesn't have the ability to seek civil pen penalties right up front. It can seek penalties if an order is violated or if a specific trade regulation rule is violated, but not in not typically in the first instance, just in an enforcement action. And so the FTC worked to get that monetary relief through other avenues, including this Section 13B. And that went on for quite a while until last year it reached the, the um, US Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said that FTC really did not have that authority. So this was a tremendous blow to the agency in terms of getting money from companies. To be honest, it was not something that we were seeing sort of uniformly or all the time in privacy and data security cases. You saw it you know, often in other types of consumer protection cases, but it was there in privacy and data security cases as well. And certainly you know, strengthened the FTC's hand. You would, for example, see it cited in settlement orders and things like that as kind of authority. Um, so that's been taken away. And in the wake of that, we definitely have seen the Federal Trade Commission, you know, doing its best looking to other kind of uh, enforcement theories, certainly continuing to vigorously enforce the laws under its jurisdiction, and kind of trying to work with this. But but that has been a, a challenging development for the agency. Nobody should uh, think that the agency doesn't have teeth now. Uh, it does. It definitely does. And you do not want to find yourselves on the receiving end of a Federal Trade Commission investigation. But this was something that kind of changed the, the scope of their remedies. They can still, as you can see on this slide, seek money penalties under other types of authorities. So for example, if there's a violation of an existing consent orders, it is our observation that those are being very actively enforced these days. Also trade regulation rules, Kelly will return to that in a moment. And then um, through other processes authorized in the Trade Commission Act. Kelly, I'll hand it over to you to talk a little bit more about the commission. Thanks. So for FTC watchers, this is a really interesting moment in the agency's history. The FTC published a strategic plan outlining their priorities for the next five years, um, just in August of this year. And one of their strategic priorities was to protect the public from unfair or deceptive acts in the marketplace, part of the FTC's mission. A key part of advancing this portion of its mission is privacy. We have a good sense of the commission's thinking on privacy. Chair Lena Khan has publicly spoken on the commission's privacy focus and released a vision and priorities document last year, which includes, um, as we say here, advocating for a new comprehensive privacy rule that has begun, as we'll see on the next slide. Also taking a holistic approach to consumer harms. Um, by this, the chair means using both the agency's consumer protection powers and its antitrust powers to identify harms to consumers. As described in this strategic planning documentation, the commission is to focus on power asymmetries and practices enabled by dominant market players to verify that the commission's efforts are geared towards addressing significant harms that cross various markets. And that moves us into the third state of priority, analyzing competition or antitrust, I think as we commonly say in the United States with privacy in mind. So consumer protection and competition are currently um, the commission's sort of dual mandates, but they are siloed at the agency currently. The goal of the commission at present is to increase cross-bureau coordination, again, to maximize agency oversight and to make sure that they are um, using their powers to regulate markets more holistically and broadly. 
Another development we wanted to highlight is the notice of penalty offense letters that the commission has taken to issuing. And some of this is tied into, as Julia just shared, I think the commission wanting to exercise its authority more broadly and being able to seek certain types of remedies that are um, they're precluded from doing so. So the FTC has power under Section 45 of the FTC Act to notify companies that certain acts or practices are deceptive or unfair. This is in advance of launching a full enforcement action or investigation. Uh, once a company is in receipt of a notice of penalty offense, it now has actual knowledge that a particular practice as outlined in the notice violates the law. And this would allow the FTC to go directly to suing for monetary damages in court. So effectively, they're kind of putting a company on notice about a particular practice, which allows them to um, move through some of the investigatory steps and move kind of to the penalty phase more quickly. Uh, thus far, the commission has sent notices to 74 profit schools, outlining seven deceptive practices that they see as common to that industry, and 700 plus national advertisers in relation to allegedly deceptive uh, endorsements and reviews. So another area where the FTC has really policed aggressively uh, in the past few years. Um, next slide, please. So making good on the promise to advocate for a new comprehensive privacy rule, earlier this summer, the FTC published a notice of proposed rulemaking on what they're calling commercial surveillance and data security. Commercial surveillance is defined in the, in the ANPR, as you see here, but it's effectively a rule that would look at digital advertising practices. The ANPR asks a series of questions about specific practices, the prevalence of these practices, um, alleged potential harms from use of these practices, the kinds of data that should be subject to any eventual rulemaking. Um, for example, should that be limited to personal data, sensitive data, data about protected categories of individuals, or even something broader such as just all data that's not aggregated. So um, the ANPR really is casting a wide net and seeking views on uh, a large number of issues. On the data security side, the ANPR focuses on what it terms to be lax data security measures and the potential injury there. So looking at moving beyond kind of conventional consumer protection inter injuries like identity theft uh, or fraud to um, alleged harms like discriminatory social media advertising. And there are you know, requests for comments um, on these topics as well. At present, the request for comment is open. Uh, it'll be there for a little shy of another month. And I think I looked this morning and there were over 5,000 comments received that they're acknowledging publicly. So certainly an area that has a lot of interest from a lot of different stakeholders. And on this one, Kelly, if you don't mind me jumping in for a second, I think it's um, helpful for folks to know that this could go in a lot of different directions and no matter what direction it goes, it's likely to take some time. So we share this sort of because it's good to be aware of in terms of, of current events. Um, but there's nothing here that requires immediate changes, for example, on the part of a company. Um, you know, at this point, it's the commission asking questions on a number of different topics that are relevant. They may take a while to issue a rule. They may issue a rule that's narrower than the questions. They may never issue a rule, um, you know, for example, if it's overtaken by other events. So this is one to sort of watch, but not immediate changes. And we get that question a lot. So I just wanted to hop in there. Thanks, Julia. That's a really good point to make. Um, so if, if we could move to the next slide, we spent most of the time this hour discussing kind of legal compliance, compliance with laws, but my colleagues and I are also experienced advocates. In fact, we believe that our compliance work is deeply informed by our advocacy. We don't just advise on the letter of the law, but on the topics that regulators are interested in and the techniques that regulators might use to gather information about your company's practices. The ANPR, of course, shows the commission's ongoing interest in privacy, but beyond the ANPR, we know that the commission is engaged in multiple investigations into companies in a variety of sectors. Um, so we wanted to pivot and just talk a little bit about what happens if you find yourself in a defensive posture with the FTC. So the first thing to note is that the commission has a variety of tools at its disposal. We just talked about the notice of penalty offenses as a potential opening uh, request or opening contact from the commission, but they have a number of other tools as well. The primary tool that they use is the civil investigative demand. We call it a CID. It's the FTC's version of a subpoena. 
a response is required by law to a CID and um, it will request documents and information. CID can also be used to request production of witnesses for a hearing. It's not typically in the first instance, but um, if an investigation sort of moves on and advances, more commonly we're seeing CIDs being used to compel witnesses to testify uh, in a, in a hearing-like setting. Um, the FTC can also start informally, though, with a letter requesting information. Sometimes they're called access letters. These seek voluntarily, voluntary cooperation, um, but although voluntary, refusal will usually lead into a CID, which is compulsory. So uh, certainly something that has to be taken seriously, even if they don't initially come kind of with a, with a compulsion of law. I think one thing we wanted to note is that your company does not have to be alleged to be a bad actor to um, fall within the commission's crosshair. So the FTC frequently does sweeps, requests to a number of companies in the same industry because they're interested in a particular industry. For example, at the beginning of the COVID pandemic in 2020, as um, schools closed and a number of different online educational technologies were used to kind of continue remote schooling, uh, the commission did a sweep into ed tech vendors um, because they were interested in a sector that had very quickly become very important and far more prominent um, than it had been previously. In the privacy space, we've seen CIDs based on uh, news stories or academic studies that name specific companies in response to large scale major events like large or significant data breaches or sometimes seemingly for, for no reason at all. But regardless of how caught a company might be caught, once a CID is received, it does have to be taken seriously. So if your company receives one, you should assume that it's a prelude to litigation and institute a litigation hold. And we've seen staff increasingly ask about document preservation and data retention issues as an investigation unfolds. There will be deadlines and timelines um, in the CID. So a date by which to acknowledge receipt and set up a meet and confer with the staffers that are handling the particular investigation. And a meet and confer really is a key time to start discussions with your staffers. Uh, they don't know what they don't know. So from their perspective, requests are kind of have a one size fits all, especially if you're caught up in a sweep. I think CIDs in a sweep are largely carbon copies of one another, um, meaning that everyone's getting the same requests. But your company may not organize its records in a way that's directly responsive to the request as written. Um, maybe some information is hard to obtain for, for reasons that are unique to your company. So your counsel should really have that dialogue with the staff uh, and come up with alternatives that are workable for both sides. Um, this is really all the start to what could be a very long back and, back and forth with staffers on an investigation. Initial requests are rarely the last word. Uh, on an issue, your company then should, in parallel, I think, start an, uh, an internal investigation into the conduct that um, the staffers are looking at to understand the company's potential exposure. And begin to think about how to message and, you know, characterize uh, your key themes back to staff in your ongoing discussions. Um, just as a, as a note, we note here is our last bullet to be prepared for a lengthy process. CIDs and investigations can take years to resolve. Um, they don't always take that long, though. Um, but, you know, it's a we want to make sure that you're on alert that you could be involved in an investigation for quite some time. I don't, Julia, do you have anything to add before we kind of pivot to our last topic? Just one thought on that, which is that I think it's never too early to begin explaining the business model to the FTC staff as well. We often find that you know, they're really excellent attorneys, but they haven't necessarily worked in industry, or if they have, they may not have worked in your industry. And so there can be a lot of misconceptions that, you know, facts that may seem obvious to you, knowing your company or your market, that may not be obvious to staff. And so explaining some of those things as much as possible up front, like limits on data collection, right, that may be obvious to you, but not to them, it can really help with avoiding misunderstandings later. And, you know, ideally, what you want is kind of an efficient resolution of, of the inquiry. So, like I said, it's, it's never too early to begin explaining um, the business model, you know, in, in response to the questions and, and making sure that things are really clear. Mm -hmm. That's a, a good insight. We we have we have more of them. Uh, <laughs> an area where we're always really interested to partner with companies and and think through how to how to message and handle an investigation. Okay, so um, 
we could just pivot to the last topic, which is going to be just a brief foray across the Atlantic Ocean uh, into the EU data privacy framework. Um, it's a topic that's top of mind for many of our clients, what's happening with EU data transfer, specifically post Privacy Shield. Um, if you could advance the slide, please. So I'm going to briefly set the stage and try to avoid doing a mini webinar um, on this topic. But, you know, the European Union through their law of GDPR, but it even predates the GDPR, um, limits data transfers outside of the EU. Um, unless you're sending data to a country that's been deemed adequate by the European Commission, or if you're using a safeguard. Common safeguards are just standard contractual clauses. You have any experience with uh, uh, contracts that cross borders, you have probably seen these form EU contracts. Um, the United States does not have an adequacy determination, but it has long had a unique arrangement with the EU. Um, again, going back pre GDPR to a program that was called the Safe Harbor. It's a, a program run by the Department of Commerce and it was deemed to be adequate by the European Commission. Um, so companies could voluntarily self-certify to the safe harbor um, and obtain kind of a veil of adequacy over the data transfers that it had certified for. Safe harbor was struck down by the European Court of Justice over concerns with U.S. government surveillance, it was replaced by a program called the Privacy Shield that was um, had some modifications but was substantively the same. Stop me if you heard this one before. The privacy shield was struck down over concerns with government surveillance by the European Court of Justice. And now negotiators are working on the third iteration, which is going to be called the EU US data privacy framework. And they've been in those negotiations for about two years, although they reached an agreement in principle in March of this year. Um, the primary concern that led to the, the two previous court decisions were around US government surveillance and national security. And the US kind of had two means by which to address it. They could have limited their surveillance and national security powers, which was seen as a pretty unpalatable option from their perspective, or they could um, give European data subjects additional means to redress violations after they had occurred. And I think it was no surprise that that's the path that was pursued by U.S. negotiators. Um, this has led us to the framework. It has three parts. The commercial self-certification part, which is largely quite the same as Privacy Shield was. It'll be maintained by the Department of Commerce and be a voluntary, voluntary self-certification for companies that are eligible to participate in the program. And an executive, off, uh, executive order in Department of Justice regulations. Um, so the executive order and the DOJ regulations are going to deal with the, the national security concerns. Um, they're going to sort of do it in two ways. So one is they're going to impose some proportionality over, you know, the European state of concerns over unbounded national security surveillance powers. And then they're going to add additional layers of responsibility, including requiring the civil, liber uh, civil liberties protection officer. Um, in the Office of the Director of National Intelligence to assess various intelligence programs, and also having a civil liberties officer with oversight authority be appointed at certain uh, intelligence agencies. The DOJ regulations separately are going to create a data protection review court that European data subjects will be able to avail themselves if they feel like they were um, surveilled unlawfully. Um, so, you know, we tried to outline, I think, some of the highlights of the executive order. If you don't regularly practice in uh, national security law, and very few people do, I think it seems a little academic, but I think it's quite meaningful from the perspective of um, putting some proportionality and kind of binding those authorities, at least vis-a-vis -vis European data subjects. Um, now that President Biden has signed the executive order, the European Commission can do their part by launching a formal adequacy determination. Typically, these have taken historically four to five months. I think there have been some hope it could get done before the end of this calendar year, but I think that's uh, a bit unlikely. And, and Q1 of next year is probably the more likely time frame. Once, hopefully, the program is found to be adequate by the European Commission, um, the U.S. can kind of do its part by once again standing up the commercial self-certification piece. It will again be through the Department of Commerce, enforced by the Federal Trade Commission. So I think from the perspective of companies who had been self-certified under the Privacy Shield, the program is largely going to look the same with some, with some minor tweaks from that perspective. Um, most of the changes are going to be on the back end. So 
sort of a, a stay tuned for 2023. If you're grappling with all of um, the paperwork that comes around data transfers, um, please know that there is some relief uh, on the horizon. Thanks, Kelly. That was great. And um, what I'm going to do now, we just have a few minutes left. So I'm going to kind of jump around in the question section. Eric and Kelly, please also feel free to jump in. But I'm going to try to just pick off a couple of the questions that we can answer maybe relatively quickly in the few minutes that we that we have left. So um, apologies in advance if we don't get to yours. We'll, we'll try to follow up. So one question that we got was that Nevada was listed on the, our state enforcement slide, but it was not listed in our map as a state with laws coming into effect. What am I missing, says our questioner. Great question. You're not missing anything. Um, so Nevada did not appear on the map because it does not have what we would call more of an omnibus privacy law. It has a narrower law that relates to an opt out of sales. And that has also been in place for a couple of years. So it's not a new change. So we do have enforcement there. We do have something that we would call a privacy law there, but much narrower. And again, it's, it's already been in effect. So we decided for today to really focus on the other states because they're newer and they're more like each other. Nevada is a little bit of an outlier in its narrowness. Um, we also got a question in terms of what we would recommend as far as trying to create a uniform policy. <clears throat> And to that end, whether it's possible to essentially aim for California compliance because, you know, on the thought that that would be the most stringent or is another state the more stringent. So unfortunately, it's not so simple as being able to say this state is, you know, the most stringent. If you satisfy them, you will have satisfied everybody else. So the, the issue is, I wish that were the answer. It would make um, our lives and these webinars so much simpler. But really, the reality is the states are a little bit uneven. So some are more stringent in some areas, others in other areas. Just as an example, I mentioned that there are certain states that have an opt-in for sensitive data. California does not. It's an opt-out. So that's just an example. California, it's it's um, not entirely compatible. And if you were just aiming for California compliance, you would not have gotten there for those other states. So it ends up being a little bit more, you have to mesh the laws more so than just look to one of them as sort of the simple uniform standard. So you can get to a uniform standard, but it involves, again, looking across the laws as opposed to just picking one out of the crowd. Um, Next question is, when can we expect clarity on definitions for personal data versus pseudonymous data? Good news for this questioner. Those definitions already do exist in the state laws, so you can go look to them in the statutes. And you know, behind the scenes, we can tell you that those pseudonymous data definitions are intended to cover, you know, sort of were crafted in the legislative process to cover things that are more device IDs, like the types of things that would be handled in an ad tech ecosystem. Um, versus what we might think of as more of an, you know, individually identifiable record, if that makes sense. So happy to follow up on that more offline. And I'll tackle one more. And then Eric and Kelly, I don't know if you see any we can do, or we may be at time. But the last question that I'll do is, does the CPRA provide exceptions for matters covered by the Gramm-Leach-Bliley Act and the Fair Credit Reporting Act, just like the current CCPA does? And the answer is yes, the CPRA has those exceptions and the other state laws also have similar exceptions. So if you are in a regulated industry and you are already covered by this type of sector specific privacy legislation um, at the federal level, there's a good chance that you can exempt at least some of your activities from the state laws. What we've seen, I've done quite a lot of work with financial institutions under the existing California law. Often, unfortunately, it's not going to cover all the data that you hold, but it may cover much of it. So you still need to be aware of the state laws. Um, sometimes the way the exemption is written, it's not everything we could hope for from an industry standpoint, but those exceptions definitely do exist. Again, not just in the new California law, but also in the other states. Yeah, but make sure that you look for state specific variation. So sometimes it's what we call an entity level exemption, i.e. if you know, if you as an entity are subject, the entire entity is exempt. Sometimes it just applies to the data. Yeah, great point. So I think we're at time. Yeah. Um, and I'll just close by saying thank you again to everybody for joining us today. Um, we can talk about this stuff forever. Hopefully our enthusiasm comes through and um, hopefully we've been able to share some of that enthusiasm with you. If there are any questions, um, please feel free to reach out to us after the session. We'd be happy to be in touch.
Thank you. Thank you.